basically. Live streamed, okay. Okay. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna crack on then. Um hi everyone. Um thanks very much for joining this webinar, uh, which is part of a series of events which we've organized to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Aldabra Research Station, which was constructed in 1971 by the Royal Society. And my name is April Burt, and I was the Aldabra Science Coordinator from April 2015 until September 2017. Um, and Aldabra, as most of you know, is an iconic atoll in the southwest Seychelles, um, and it's famous for its giant tortoises and um, a wealth and diversity of other um, life within the marine and terrestrial ecosystems. And Aldabra has been managed by the Seychelles Islands Foundation since 1979. And then in 1982, it was inscribed a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And over the years, the research and monitoring programs have developed and evolved. And today we joined together for the first time um, Aldabra Science Coordinators, past and present. Um, this role entails living on Aldabra and working together with the logistics team to um, achieve both the research and management objectives for Aldabra. So for the next hour, we will imagine that we're sat at the flagpole looking out over Settlement Reef, um, watching the sun go down in half an hour or so, and um, preferably with a sabre in hand as well. And so without further ado, I'd like to pass over to um, Jock to introduce yourself and we'll go through the other Aldabra science coordinators. Cool, thanks April. Hi everyone, my name's Jock Curry. Uh, I uh, grew up in Namibia, um, but currently live in Cape Town in South Africa. And I was, uh, as we call them, research officers back in 2010, April 2010 till April 2011. So it's quite a while back. Uh, I also, the first time I got to go to Aldabra was in 2007, for specifically for a goat eradication program. So I spent a few months there that time and then went back as, uh, in 2010. And yeah, I'm a marine scientist. Uh, I've carried on after that doing a PhD and uh, currently working on a postdoc at the South African National Biodiversity Institute in Cape Town. I think that's, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Over to you, Naomi. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Thanks, April and Jock. I think actually um, I, I was the science coordinator just before Jock. So I was November 2008. To mm. April 2010. Um, I am from Australia and I'm currently based in Australia, but uh, I work still in conservation, uh, this time on, on large grey land mammals, so generally elephants and rhinos. Not many of them in Australia, more over with Jock, but um, that's where I, what I focus on at the moment. I actually went to Aldabra initially as a volunteer and as I landed back in the Seychelles from, I was working in the main islands of the Seychelles on the frogs. Um, and it, I then moved, came home to Australia, uh, went back to go to Aldabra as a volunteer. I thought that was about the only chance I was going to get to visit Aldabra. And when I landed back on Mahe Frauka, the CEO of Seychelles Island Foundation at the time and still CEO, uh, called me into her office and asked me if I'd like to take on the role as, of um, research officer, science coordinator, whichever you like to call them. Um, and that's how I ended up on our Dabri almost for two years then, rather than the six months I'd initially signed up for. Awesome story. Um, over to you, Janske. Hey, hello everyone. It's, it's really nice to be here. I wanted to just say to see all of you and hopefully have some, uh, some audience in the digital room. A really nice initiative. Um, I'm uh, Janske van Krommenakke, originally from the Netherlands. And uh, well, I've been uh, walking around in Seychelles already since 2002. Uh, first as a master's student and then PhD on the Seychelles Warbler on Cousin Island. 
And then afterwards I heard of this treasure called Aldabra and I approached SIF if I could uh, work for them in whatever position. And they were looking for a new RO or then the new title ASC. So uh, yeah, I've been there as ASC from April 2011 until April 2012. 13 and afterwards i also worked there further as a researcher on the mainly genetic projects uh, and then afterwards i've been also working on other uh, seychelles islands as conservation manager dennis island fregat island and now since 2018 i've returned to the netherlands and i work now for bird life so still into nature of course <laughs> Awesome, you've done quite a few islands, Janske. <laughs> okay, over to you, Cheryl. Hi, everyone. I'm Cheryl. I'm originally from Florida, um, but um, I studied, I did my master's there with sea turtles, and anyone who's in the Seychelles knows of Jean Mortimer and um, her advisor was Archie Carr. So I knew the Seychelles for quite a while because of sea turtles. And I ended up getting to the Seychelles and working um, on Curious Island, um, similar to April, I kind of, uh, <laughs> April will tell you too, but um, went to Curious and then to Kuzan and never ever thought I'd ever be able to get to Aldabra. So, um, I was there from September 2017 to um, March 2020, 2019, 2020, one of those. Um, but yeah, so it's really nice to, to see you guys. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Cheryl. And then I'll pass over to Luke, who is on Aldabra. I am. I'm the luckiest one of everyone. I, have, no, I don't feel sorry for you all because you're all doing such wonderful things, but it is great to be on Aldabra right now. Um, yeah, so I'm the current ASC. I actually started at the Valley de May first, the other UNESCO World Heritage Site that Seychelles Island Foundation manages. So I was science coordinator there for a few months. And then, yeah, I got the chance to come to Aldabra and of course, who would turn that down? And I started almost two years ago, just as Cheryl was finishing. So we had a bit of an overlap. I met April briefly when you came to do your research here. And I've read all about Naomi, Jansker and Jock. And I, I read some of your annual reports today, actually, just to see what you guys were up to all those years ago. So it was quite good. I know Jock's got some good stories from what I read in one of his reports. So yeah, really excited to talk to you all. Awesome. Well, I have to say, Luke, if there's ever a time to be on Aldabra, it's during a pandemic. So you've done yeah, well. Yeah, really got lucky, huh? That's bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to shoot straight in with um, a nice question. Um, so I'll start with Jock. If you could tell me about one of your best memories from Aldabra. Sure. Okay. Well, it being 10 years ago, it's a bit hard to pick out uh, the memories or remember them clearly. But yeah, I think I think one of the highlights, I mean, I'm, I'm a, quite a keen water a sports person. So I spend a lot of time underwater, even around here in the colder waters. Um, I think diving free diving snorkeling um in the passes was i had multiple incredible experiences um it really highlighted to me what a a baseline coral reef uh, system or a, a lagoon system should look like um you know just the, the kinds of fish you'd see there or the kind of experiences you see there with you know one one breath on one breath hold you'll, you'd see multiple big sort of number species that you'd be stoked to see on uh, on a single trip to most other places and you'd see you know multiple of them in one breath old so things like giant uh, humphead parrotfish and uh, you know giant trevally and always see turtles pass cruising over or past you um yeah i mean i've got lots of video clips i had a little a waterproof camera that I took along and I've got some crazy video clips of just going from shark to turtle to amazing rare big you know big predatory fish and yeah I'd say that those are probably some of the highlights that stand out for me. 
Did you have a favourite spot for snorkelling? I know we've all got our own little personal ones, I think. <laughs> um, you know, I had some incredible experiences in, multi in, in multiple places. I would definitely say on the, on the vertical walls in, in, in the past near Middle Camp, I think that was a, really a memorable one uh, mm -hmm. on a slack tide there. You have to be careful which tides you, you get in yeah. the water there. Yeah, uh, small window. Yeah. I think that that stood out as one of the most amazing. Awesome, thank you. I'll go over to Naomi now. Um, yeah, probably much the same as, as, as Jock described. I think just, um, I, I did my undergraduate degree in marine biology and zoology. So, you know, that the time underwater there was almost always as, as precious and as memorable as the time you spent on the atoll itself, I think. Um, but, you know, as, as memorable as all of the underwater time was, I think even just being able to be, you know, whether you were moving from settle, settlement beach and, and the research station to the camps or spending time at the camps, I think just being in, like so much in nature, you know, there's, there's no light pollution, there's no you know, there's plenty of plastic pollution, April, as, as you and everybody will have seen, but I think you still feel like you are completely um, in nature and you're so far away from everything else. And I think that's a feeling that is replicated there when you are under the water and you're just surrounded by wildlife, but even just being able to sit and watch the tortoises go about whatever they're doing and, and check, looking at the birds and measuring the coconut crabs, all of those things. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, it's a really difficult experience to describe that subconscious feeling of being so far away and, and so much in nature. You know, I live in Australia. I grew up in Australia. It's an enormous continent with lots of nature, but you're never that far away from someone yeah. else or from from civilization as we call it you know and I think there are moments on Aldebra underwater and above where you realize just how much you are in nature and how far away you are from from everybody else except yeah. the 12 or so other people that you're sharing it with. Yeah it's a very stark comparison as to yeah. what what nature could be like in other places as well if it was left undisturbed. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Over to Janske. Yeah, so many beautiful memories, of course. It's, it's, this is a really difficult question, <laughs> April. <laughs> but anyway, I think I pick being one with nature. That was the most brilliant uh, experience of all, I think. I often think now I'm back in, in Holland, in Europe, I realize I don't even know now what moon phase it is, for example. Mm. Well, on Aldabra, you know, it, I mean, it would be stupid if you wouldn't know uh, because you, 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 you use it as your torch. Uh, it's, it's the tides that, that are completely influenced by the moon phase. So the, and hey, with no moon, you have to bring your torch. Otherwise you would bump into uh, the giant tortoises yeah. that are li laying uh, around in the station. So uh, that and, and hey, going on camp, uh, hey, that the tortoises try, you have to be careful that the, the tortoises don't eat uh, everything. You have to leave your food very properly because had the animals will eat it. Also, once I was doing a bird count with uh, Terence Mahoon, uh, we had to do that for a few weeks. And every day, a plane would come by at half past four. And that was the only sign of human civilization somewhere far away. And we actually, one day, this plane was not coming over. And we would always note it down on our on our paper. And one time it didn't come by. <laughs> we, we actually became worried about that. Like, <laughs> oh, would something have happened? <laughs> that kind of weird things. It's and also the people with who you live there. It's mm. I still remember and still feel they are family because you're with so few people on this uh, on this atoll. So yeah. You have to do it together there, and that's really, really special. That creates a bond. Yeah, certainly does create a very strong bond within the team there. Yeah. Okay, Cheryl, over to you. 
Okay, so I thought of a specific one. When I first arrived, it was in September, in the beginning of September, and September, I think 22nd, I was I went to my first camp at Sinkas. <laughs> Ronnie, one of our rangers, came to pick us up and was like, it, just like you said, you know, everyone becomes family really fast. So he was like, ah, oh, there's two extra islands in the lagoon. <laughs> we were like, I don't even know what you're saying. Okay, sure. Two extra islands. And then we go and there were the two humpback adult whales that had gotten stranded in the, in Passoiro. And um, it was very sad, but it was also, it was like the kickoff of this is what Aldabra is because you don't know what's gonna happen. All these things are just going to happen. The tides, um, the whole place is just difficult to live with. I mean, these two adults getting stranded in a lagoon, who would have thought? And then later going back and seeing tiger sharks that were just bigger than anything. I mean, just handfuls of tiger sharks and their heads were like, I wish I could show you. Awesome. They were like, no, I can't. They were huge. Um, so I feel like um, we all did this because we are just so passionate about wildlife and the people who live there now are just so passionate about keeping up this place that's so biodiverse. But you have these moments that happen and you just look at each other like, what? <laughs> that happened. So that was the kickoff to like, everything else happened as well but yeah those are, those I remember that happened just after I left and I, yeah. I was really sad for the humpbacks because I think we'd been watching them all season but also I realized what an opportunity that was to see all the sharks that you never usually see like um the tigers coming in really shallow um and you guys got some awesome footage of that exactly now I guess with Luke um he's seen quite a few cool things over the last year um so over to you Luke I have, yeah. And I think just to pick up on everyone else said, like going in the water, like Jock said, you can see so much in so little amount of time. It's, and you get so normalized by it. And I think that's what I'm worried about leaving this place is that I'm so immersed in the richness of life in isolation that leaving it is going to be incredibly sad, you know, not to put a down on it straight away there, but just because I'm projecting. It is. But it yeah, is. I've had some amazing, amazing sightings. Like, Last year we went out to try and, well, we we're gonna do some whale watching, but we just got past the reef opposite the research station. And Jude, the island manager saw like seven dorsal fins sticking out the water. And it turned out there was like 70 scalloped hammerhead uh, sharks just swimming along all in a group. And so we jumped in and swam with them, but it, it took a bit of time. Everyone was sort of uneasy about going in first. So like everyone's sort of checking their fins and like, oh, I've got to check my camera. And, eventually the one of our South African rangers went in and when he didn't die we were like oh, okay we can go in there and it was just breathtaking to see that amount of sharks all swimming together and just really not fussed at all about us just kept going and oh, I was yeah it was brilliant yeah I yeah. can imagine that's an incredible that cool. thing to see um yeah it um, really was I think that's getting rarer and rarer around the world you know obviously it definitely is yeah definitely um, it's also one of those things is you can be on Aldabra for two years and you can see some really cool stuff, but there are other things you still haven't seen. So it just oh, yeah, yeah, like there's always more. Spend 10 there's years more. there and you'd get a new experience all of a sudden. Yeah, every day there's a new animal behavior. Even the tortoises, like the ways they sleep. I've got so many different photographs of tortoises asleep because I'm like, oh man, that's amazing. How is he sleeping like that today? And oh, it's amazing. <laughs> Keeps you entertained for hours. <laughs> yeah, it really does. Well, I guess those are all the like the wonderful moments that we've had. But obviously, Aldabra is a contrasting place, so it's full of these incredible moments. But it's also very challenging. Not just the um, the environment, which is quite hostile to humans, um, but it's isolation as well. So I know that you've all had your own um, challenging experiences on Aldabra, and I think. Jock, you were there when the goat eradication was going on. And can you tell us about the challenges involved with that? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I think there were many challenging days, uh, both during the initial program that I was there in 2007 for, and then again, uh, as the research officer in 2010, where we had to recolor some of the, the Judas goats. So um, the idea being that you've got some collared goats that you can track with telemetry equipment, because otherwise they're almost impossible to find. Um, and yeah, I think uh, on Grand Terra, I mean, on the entire atoll, the, the um, terrain is really jagged and, and really sort of bushy and difficult to move around on in many places. So we, you know, there were many days where we spent very long days walking very many kilometers through very thick scrub and bush and uh, over difficult terrain. Um, and and often you'd, you'd do that tracking down a goat and you'd get within 20, 30, 40 meters of it and it would still be in thick bush and then it would hear you and run away. Oh, God. <laughs> you wouldn't even get to see them. But So there were, there were, I mean, there's one day in particular where I remember I've calculated afterwards, I'd covered about 26 kilometers, I'd run out of water, um, mm -hmm. I'd been all scratched up and bruised climbing through bush. Um, so yeah, there were some physically really tough days, also incredibly hot. I mean, the tropical heat there is, is something else if you're not used to it. Um, yeah, those, you know, those, they, they were definitely some tough days. And it also made it so much more, the, you know, the, the accomplishments or when you did find the goats or when, when you know, when once the, go, the eradication program was, was um, it was, deemed to be a success or to, you know it took a while but a few years later it was finally um certified to be to be a success so it was really yeah it made made those moments sweeter i suppose and it was it was amazing managing to read a dart and and recolor the goats when we did manage it a couple of times so yeah, yeah i but can imagine that's usually that's satisfying around. i yeah. mean it, being on Aldabra in 2015, it was hard to imagine goats being there because, you know, there just wasn't any signs of it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's really just really impressive to think that you went hunting around um, those vast, difficult islands, especially Guantair. Um So, yeah. And I think, Naomi, you were also part of the, the goat eradication at the time. Yeah, so I arrived on the atoll, I think, uh, a couple of months after Jock had been there initially to do the the first um, Judas goat operations and, and attach radio collars. And then um, throughout my time as research officer, um, ASC, we had to stagger goat eradication expeditions with the... Um, uh, ongoing what the monthly monitoring and the camp visit so yeah lots of right who who is how are we going to do this and where are the goats and and where do we need to focus by that stage a lot of them um, had been removed in the first sort of stage of that operation I think um at, by the time Jock got back it was much the same the ones that were left were the ones that were had pretty much clued on to what was going on and were very cunning on staying in the Pemphis and away from people and nowhere near where they were last time. So again, yeah, as he described, lots of time, lots of pairs of shoes actually, um, uh, uh, sort of scrabbling around trying to find them, getting the, the drugs and the things that we needed and the batteries to re-collar if collars had run out. And um, yeah, so lots of time over on that side of the atoll trying to find the elusive remaining goats. Yeah, so for those who are listening who are not aware, the, the goats were an invasive species on Aldabra and they were chewing up all the vegetation um, and really out competing with the tortoises for that vegetation that's so precious on Aldabra. Um, and this is one of several eradications that have taken place. I think, um, Jansko, can you tell us about the challenge of finding the Mada bodies at Takamaka and how, how you tackled that one? Yeah, well, actually that is linked to the goat eradication because it was during the, the last searches for, for any remaining goats. I was there in the very, very, very last phase when, when Andy shot actually the last goat. Um, 
we had to, of course, verify that there were no goats anymore. So we had to walk the whole uh, of Grand Terre, also the places where we almost would never come. So, and back then uh, it was uh, Ranger Stan who uh, actually saw the birds at uh, Takamaka. It looked like a Madagascar Fody. And then afterwards we went back with the team, but that's not easy because it's totally on the other side of the, of the research sta station, the Takamaka area. And you actually can get there only with spring tides uh, by boat. So um, it, we had to plan it very well. And then indeed we found that there was a group of uh, Madagascar Fodis uh, on the atoll. So then we had to, to think well, like what are we going to do? And we had to undertake action. So um, we had to also know how many there were, uh, whether they were breeding um, and all these questions, you have to get to know your en enemy before you can fight it. So, but it also in, involved a lot of uh, practical uh, and logistical things like you can't go up and down in a day to Takamaka. You can go via middle camp, but at some point we realized like this is going to be a big project first to do all the, the bird counts and then afterwards do an actual eradication. So we, we had to set up uh, a hut and first, that involved uh, uh, making water, uh, water, rainwater catchment. Um, the first visits, we had to actually carry our, our drinking water all the way from the lagoon uh, landing stage to the, the point where the Fodis were. A three, three, 45 minutes walk on the, on the rugged terrain. Um, and we had to then afterwards bring all the, first we camped quite some times, but also bringing all the food. It was, it was heavy because there was nothing. And sometimes you had to stay there for several days before you could go back uh, again. Um, and then afterwards building the huts, oh my God, for the team that was uh, such a challenge because it's, it is hot there. It's uh, also landing by the outside by boats. You, you had a choice, 45 minutes uh, through uh, the lagoon, the mangroves, and then over the uh, via the inside of the atoll or the lagoon, or via the outside. But then the sea was very rough, but the walk was much shorter. So sometimes building those materials for the for the hut on land was very it's quite dangerous. So it was a it was a huge operation, and and then afterwards when the hut was there, the actual eradication itself was also. Yeah, it was a, a huge project, but in the end, yeah, we as a whole group managed and that's something that we can be really proud of. Yeah, it was an excellent um, rapid response to finding the bodies and then, um, you know, SIF instigated um, mapping their territories and then planning the eradication, not just on Aldabra, but also on uh, Assumption, yeah. which is the neighboring island because there's no point in eradicating from one island because they can fly back over. So that yeah. was a double challenge. Yeah, but then also we, we found out that actually they were, it looked like they were hybridizing. So, well, then we also went into a whole genetic study to also see like also where the Madagascar Fodis would come from. Would they come from assumption? Would it be sort of human mediated uh, introduction or would it be natural we we really wanted to justify what we did and thanks to this genetic study we could also verify that there was a big danger in the aldabra fodies and the madagascar fodies hybridizing so that was an extra reason to to act fast so we really really tried to do that with uh, a lot of uh, yeah fact checking <laughs> yeah i think it's a great example of um how SIF pursued science to um, drive management or to inform the management decisions made around the eradication. Um, so you did all the genetic studies yourself, didn't you, Jens? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was a very steep learning curve, but uh, very interesting and glad it worked out so well. That yeah. was fantastic to, to, do, to, to combine that research for actually conservation purposes. Yeah. yeah. 
I, I often, still quite often give a talk about that at the university or whatever, and everybody's like, whoa, amazing. <laughs> because it is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very amazing. You should be very proud. Well, we all should, yeah. Okay, Cheryl, I guess uh, you, you came across some challenges in your two and a half years on the Atoll. Yeah, there are definitely some challenges. I yeah. think, um, I mean, you guys all paved the way ahead of time doing the goats <laughs> and the eradication, which I think was probably some of the toughest um, physical work, I think. Um, I would say a physical work-wise, the toughest challenges were when we were, I, it was at the tail end of your, your time, April, when changing up the tortoise um, transects. But so we changed up the tortoise transects a little bit and um, modified the program and um, had to cut a few more tortoise transects. And um, I don't know, I, I mean, I was helping, um, but we had some amazing people like the Thank team. Thank God for Ronnie Marie at the time. Oh eh? my gosh, Ronnie and um, Edward. I mean, and uh, so many more people. I, I don't know. People are superhumans on Aldabra. Um, and they just were like, I'd be like cutting a transect, sweating, and then they'd look up and they'd be like 10 feet ahead. And I have no idea how they did it. But we spent quite a lot of time doing that. And that was probably. Uh, some of the more challenging, like not normal monitoring, you know, with the challenges that come with monitoring. Um, but you guys all definitely did a great job with all the eradications. I think that was probably the toughest physical work. Yeah, definitely um, a lot of physical exertion, blood, sweat, and sometimes some tears when doing the uh, field work. Definitely tears. <laughs> uh, Luke, how about you? Um, yeah, I just echo what everyone else says, really, like the terrain, it can be tough in so many different ways because you've got like the really sharp champignon areas where even like the slightest fall and they usually happen in slow motion, you're going to like potentially cut your hand open, cut your knee open and you just sort of see yourself going down and it can break, uh, break a lot. But um, when I first got here and Annabelle, I can see is on the call. She's a PhD student at the University of Zurich who's doing a PhD on the mangroves of Aldabra. But I, uh, I was on her like field team as soon as I arrived on the atoll. And I think I went to St. Kaz two or three days after I arrived. Cheryl sent me there with Annabelle. <laughs> and I spent 12 days at St. Kaz in the mangroves. And it was amazing. And I'd never been in a mangrove system before. And like, for those of you who don't know, like the, the St. Kaz mangroves are probably the most extensive on the atoll or some of them. And just weaving our way through that. And Annabelle always wanted to plots at the back. And we'd go here and then have to count like... I swear, I was like a thousand trees in this little small plot and Annabelle had to measure them all. And it was great. It was amazing. We went to some crazy places that people probably have never been to around the St. Croix mangrove. So that was, it was yeah. tough, but an amazing experience. So thanks Annabelle for doing that wonderful PhD. <laughs> I often used to think when we were in really isolated places, maybe no one's ever put their foot here before, but you know, probably Jock did. Or... I always think that. I always think that and like make sure you tread your boot in a little bit harder and you're like yes that's the first footprint ever there yeah exactly. not that I do that I don't do that <laughs> um so we've got we've we've got about 15 minutes left of questions amongst ourselves before opening up to people so I'm gonna ask us to be quicker on these next questions and I'll probably just ask one of you um so Luke can I ask you about how the the um how things change on the atoll between the two seasons so not just weather wise but also with the work plan that you do yeah sure i think essentially the atoll is only accessible to the outside world between november and april that's the only time that the boats saf has can do a safe crossing to assumption where's the runway so between november and april there's so much work crammed in because you have external researchers coming we also have our marine monitoring program then, which is when the sea is calm, as uh, you well know. So that can be just a really crazy busy time where there's, there's there could be 25 people on the atoll. So there has to be more fishing trips. And there's also more monitoring. 
but the weather's hotter and the sea's calm. So that kind of compensates for it. And then the Southeast, I feel like you get in a much more natural rhythm. And I, I don't know, I feel like the tides, I'm just in this Al, uh, Aldabra rhythm and isolation where you just, it's got its own speed where it goes slow, but fast at the same time. It's, I'm sure you can all appreciate that. So I'd say it's calm in the Southeast, even though the wind is stronger and then it's sort of, it's dichotomous almost. It's the opposite. The winds are slower in the Northwest, but the work is more intense. Yeah, I always think um, the southwest is like reward for the northwest, and then by the time yeah, you get to yeah, the end, the southeast, you're very much wishing for the northwest and all the busy ins and outs again. Um, but also, yeah, you get the true. whales in the southeast, so that's a bonus, isn't it? Mm, that's true. They just arrived uh, two weeks ago, actually. So that's that's nice. nice. Um, so, Jock, how did you maintain a kind of work-life balance when you were on that all? obviously there's lots of work going on but you also have to have some fun and um you know party a bit <laughs> yeah um sure yeah i mean you just you just try to get out and make the most of of all your any time off that you got um i must say i think i probably didn't maintain the balance that well i was still finishing up my msc at the time uh, so sundays i would often sit and type up bits of my master's uh, thesis for the first several months I was there. And, uh, and, and looking back, that is a bit of a regret that I didn't get to spend more, you know, get to really uh, immerse myself more in those in the amazing outdoors there and get out and have fun in it. Um, but it's where I was at at the time and what needed to be done. Um, but yeah, definitely Luke, get out there and make the most of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. And uh, Janska, did you, I mean, barbecues are a big part of the, the life on Aldabra. Um, so, you know, those, those team barbecues that you have all over the place, they're just such wonderful experiences. Do you have good memories of those? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> he has. Oh, they were, they, yeah, they were brilliant. I mean, yeah, the, the food as well as the atmosphere, as well as the people, as well as the background. It's just amazing. Uh, just barbecuing there on the beach with the sun setting. That was my work. Uh, uh, how do you say work? Uh, Life really balance. Balance as well. Like uh, I al always wanted to, to really watch the sunset every day. And that is possible on Aldabra. I mean, it's just in front of your house. It's just so amazing. So, um, but yeah, all those barbecues, they ended up being uh, parties and, and just nice music, lots of domino. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I learned to, to, to play domino there and it was, uh, yeah, it was superb. I have really fond memories of that. Yeah, I, I used to love um, the communal dinners. That was a great part of um, life on the atoll where you all, you're doing your own thing all through the day and then together in the evening you come together and you have some nice um, rice and some lentils and some fish probably. Yeah, and the food was was so good. I mean, that was, I was also amazed like what food there was and also how the shop was stocked. The, yeah, and then of course the fresh fish, fish which you catch yourself with the the, um, the subsistence fishing mm. so yeah yeah it's just nice indeed to end the day like that definitely and Naomi can you tell us what your favorite monitoring program was on the atoll oh that's a tough one um I, um I quite like the coconut crabs bizarrely um I don't think they were everyone's favorite possibly because it was a, a night, they were night transects. And, and I think, you know, the coconut crabs, um, when you're on camp, on some of the camps were seen more of a pest than anything else, because they get into everything and they tear stuff apart and they look for food. But, um, you know, I just, again, like the two transects there, the, the one along the sort of beach, just inside the beach and main beach there settlement, and then further inland, you just see so many amazing things. The night, I love the night jars and you would always see them um, doing the coconut crab transects. But also I think it's just beyond the tortoises, which a lot of uh, are favorites for a lot of people, I think, that 
to me, they were just something that was so uniquely Aldebra, uh, that many coconut crabs, the size of them, all of it. I just, you know, I've, I've been really lucky since my role there to travel to some amazing places in the world and I've never seen coconut crabs like the ones there. So I just, yeah, I think that it was probably one of my favourites. Yeah, the, the coconut crabs are very interesting, but having woken up in the night many times to having them stroking my head, um, maybe not my favourite. Yeah. <laughs> Cheryl, do you have any, um, your favourite monitoring program or? Oh, definitely. Um, there's a few though, because um, definitely um, turtle tracks in the morning, because who doesn't want to walk on a beach and look for turtle tracks? Um, rodeo, catching turtles by boat, not because it's turtles, <laughs> but, um, and also anything that took me into the lagoon. So the frigate bird breeding program, which was new, um, where you had to like go through this ridiculously beautiful lagoon to get to these mangrove systems and sit and be quiet and count birds in front of you. I mean, this doesn't feel like work. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> what was your favorite? What was your favorite, April? I think um, marine monitoring. Ah, uh, yeah. But, but having said that, um, one of my best memories on Aldabra was doing the first frigate census that I did. Oh. And there was a huge storm while we were in the lagoon, and it felt like we were in the middle of the sea. And me um, and yeah, the rangers were just kind of, it was such an adventure. And we were count, trying to count frigate birds. And then a tiger shark arrived, and it was just, oh. yeah. So it's just those unique experiences that mm -hmm. you have um, were just unforgettable. Um, so Luke, I guess things have changed quite a lot over the years with monitoring. Can you describe briefly kind of what a standard month looks like now um, with the monitoring programs that you're doing on the camp trips? Okay. So obviously every morning, 7 a.m., there's settlement beach tracks. So one lucky person gets to walk the two kilometers. Um, and just to note that we hit, it's been the highest average daily emergence ever was in March, 2021 this year. I think we averaged 49 turtles a night for the whole month, which wow. is crazy, huh? Absolutely mad. Yeah. I was looking at your guys' reports from 10 years ago and it was about 25, I think the maximum maybe in 2010 a night. So it's doubled almost in that time, which is incredible, huh? And that's all happened without the MPA, without any like ocean protection. It's just by protecting the nesting beaches. I digress. So <laughs> yeah, there is settlement beach tracks, of course. And then we have land bird point counts done every quarter, thanks to Janska's review that she did a few years ago. Thank you, saved us doing it every month and that's good. <laughs> we also have turtle rodeo which we're doing quite a lot at the moment because of Cheryl's PhD research so that the team is over the moon by that we're trying to do I think we're doing it eight times a month or something it's wow. crazy because we're collecting wow. skin samples of juvenile turtles for Cheryl's PhD research. Um, we also do marine debris accumulation on all the south coast beaches which is a spin-off from April's PhD research and how much marine debris is washing off on average now, uh, April? Sorry, we, we calculated that recently, or you calculated that recently, didn't you? Well, you've put me on the spot here now, um, but you know, it I changes remember, a lot depending which beach you're on. I think it's something yeah, like true. 60 K, no, 60 tons a year. I think we were. Yeah, I think that's what you said, yeah. Uh, which well, is crazy. Nice. Yeah, it's insane. And yeah, that can be an incredibly depressing job, especially because we were doing it every day for certain periods for April's research. So, you know, we'd clear a hundred meter section and then to get the daily accumulation rate, we'd clear it again the next day. And it's, it's like you were not there the day before. It's incredibly depressing. Um, yes. And then, sorry, go. No, you, you carry on. Uh, so other monitoring programs, we do plant phenology as well, which I think that's been ongoing for a very long time, along back path, which you'll all fondly remember. Find some Ocna ciliata. That's one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> gosh, what else do we do? It 
it's crazy. We don't actually do any uh, coconut crab transects at the moment, Naomi. You'll be interested to know. We're in the works to pick that back up again, which, so you were here at the right time. A, a rubber crab, a coconut crab actually stole my camera last night. I was trying to do some star trail pictures and I left my camera out for an hour and I came back and it had gone. Luckily the light was still on it and it was, it was in the champignon like 10 meters away, but good job I got there then. Um, so I'd say it's basically the, the same things that were going on sort of 10, 15 years ago, but slightly refined. And it's, it's just constantly changing and learning and improving things, which I think you've all contributed to that, which is, it's really great to be able to stand on your shoulders, so to speak. So thank you everyone. Awesome. Well, um, we, we've got so much to talk about and we've got so little time, so I'm going to try and speed things up a bit here. Um, obviously, on a more serious note, the IPCC report came out this week um, with some stark warnings about the impacts of climate change that are coming. And, you know, Seychelles and Aldabra specifically are really in the line for these kind of threats. Um, so with that in mind, I wanted to ask you all kind of, what your hopes are for the future of Aldabra and um, what kind of projects you want to see um, unfolding over the next few years. Should we go to Naomi? Yeah, sure, actually, I, I guess in my head, I, I, I figured you'd ask some kind of tricky wrap up question, April and the IPP, IPCC report definitely jumped to mind. There's been a lot of coverage over it here. And, and at least um, in Australia, a lot of criticism for our inaction. I think all of that, you know, and, and the fact that Aldabra is a World Heritage site and I have quite a lot still to do with World Heritage locations all around the world. And I think, you know, quite often they're all seen in isolation. And I think it, in climate change conversations, we're still talking about it in isolation. We're talking about countries, we're talking about sites or low-lying low islands. And I think um, the nature of the world these days is more about connectivity and how everything is linked. And for me, I think working out a way to look at monitoring and detecting and, and in improving resilience to climate change in Aldabra is really important, but to be able to do that across similar locations across the globe rather than just in isolation. So whether that be marine world heritage sites or world heritage sites more generally, whether they be have such an important marine component or not, because I think the only way we're going to find solutions and, and really detect trends and, and impacts is to look at a much larger scale. Aldabra is huge and the scale that you're looking at in one site is enormous, but I think being able to link it and, and replicate some of that, those projects and monitoring around climate change and its impacts in multiple sites is, is what I would hope, because I think yeah. that's the only way we're going to really inform action to tackle this. Yeah, I know that SAF are undertaking or looking to undertake vulnerability um, assessments for um, the different impacts of climate change. And um, but there is also, you know, reason to hope. Um, Aldabra has shown a great resilience um, in Anna Cresta's research recently. She showed that the corals in the lagoon are um, less, less impacted and recover quicker from um, bleaching events. And Aldabra as a whole also recovered quite quickly from the 2016 bleaching event, which saw a 52% reduction in hard coral cover. Um, so yeah, there's, there's certainly glimpses of hope there. Um, I guess, Luke, what, what would you like to see over the next few years, not just in terms of the research, but um, maybe in the ASC role and other things? The ASC role. Um... Not too sure about the ASC role, but I, I really think that there's still so much to know about Aldabra and there's so much to do. So I, I would really love to see sort of a, a doubling of the capacity of the research station, sort of double the reservoir storage, triple the size of the garden and make it really, really rat proof. So I'm, I'm sort of thinking in that context because, and it'd be great to get more educational input here and have more young Seishawa coming out. So that's really what yeah. sort of my vision for what I think this place could need, because you could have double the staff and really 
look into more specific questions about this place because there's so much we still don't know. I think that's a really good point um, with regards to um, bringing more Seychelles law into the research program. And, you know, just over the last few years, there's been some incredible projects from Seychelles law. And um, I know some of your team are already leading their own projects down there. Um, so this is, um, a, you know, a great thing to see. And um, SAF is really a champion for mentoring um, and, you know, skill exchange throughout their staff team. So um, that's, that's great. Um, let me just look at my questions. Okay, big, big projects on the horizon. Janska, there's one I'm thinking about. Which one are you thinking about? <laughs> the, the big eradication. The? The big eradication. Yeah, the, the big rat eradication. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be the most, most amazing thing if, if that would be ever possible to happen. Because as you know, Aldabra is still uh, home to a lot of uh, rats. And yeah, they, they destroy a lot in terms of vegetation, uh, plants, insects, eggs, uh, whatever, name it, and they eat it. So, um, but, but this is a huge project. And uh, back in my time, uh, my time, my husband, he, he uh, um, with, with a lot of help from a lot of people, already tried to look more into the biology of the rats. And before you would take on su such thing as eradication, that would have to be something with helicopters and spreading bait over the atoll. But you have to know also what's the effect on the other animals, of course. You have to know your enemy again. Where are the most rats? When do they reproduce? When they are when are they weakest in the season? So that's yeah. that is a lot of homework and it costs so much. So you want it it to to succeed yeah. so i hope one day there will be the money and also the knowledge to to be be able to do that because if oh if aldabra would be rat free imagine what would happen i think yeah a it's... lot would would change it's already a really great place but then it will change even more and I know that um, easier the eradication birth. is top on the agenda for the next, you know, is the next big uh, management action for Aldabra. Um, yeah. Nancy Bunbury, of course, she has her eye closely covering all the research that's coming out from around the world to make sure that um, when we do the eradication, it's going to be effective. And I believe there was a feasibility study that, that happened when you were around. That I think it was estimated about 12 million um, euros would be needed to complete yeah, the eradication. So if anyone's listening yeah. and you have 12 million euros <laughs> or you know someone who does, uh, please get in contact with us. <laughs> yeah. Miracles will happen if the rats are gone, I think. Yeah. That's for exactly. sure. So um, we, we're short on time. So there's one thing that I did want to talk about, which is the fact that the ASC position, the Aldabra Science Coordinator position, is now up for grabs. And Luke, do you want to um, just explain a bit more about that? Uh, well, yes, my time is unfortunately uh, drawing to a close as it does for everyone who is a research officer or science coordinator. Uh, but applications close, I think on the 16th of August. So please anyone out there in the world listening, if you have got remote living experience, and a degree in conservation please apply and and will you be doing a handover luke um oh yeah you'll you'll get to work with me for a few months as well which hopefully will be enjoyable i don't know uh, uh, maybe <laughs> maybe that'll pull people off i don't know and uh cheryl you're going down to aldabra this season to do your phd research is that right yes then be hanging out with luke again <laughs> Yes, I'll be there for a little bit, uh, very luckily. So whoever goes. What will that be about? Um, looking at um, foraging ecology of um, so mega fauna, so the sea turtles within the lagoon, um, looking at um, prey preferences and then what's available because there's quite a lot um, 
has a lot to do with how systems are changing right now and collapses of ecosystems such as seagrass systems. So it's quite important to know that stuff before it happens so you know what's going on. And looking at abundance of turtles in the lagoon. And um, yeah, that's, that's the snapshot of it. But um, it's only possible because SIF, the SIF Aldapra team is collecting a lot of tissue samples. Thank you, Luke and team, <laughs> everyone. It's amazing. And um, yeah, it might be just worth mentioning, of course, that um, those of us who have done this role in the past, um, several of us have gone on to do PhDs, um, myself and Cheryl, which we're currently doing our PhD. Janska had already done hers, I think. Um, and now she's working at BirdLife International. And Jock, are you working at um, the university in South Africa at the moment? Um, yeah, well, yeah, I'm registered at a university for a postdoc, um, but mainly working with the South, Af South African National Biodiversity Institute. And that's basically the mandate is uh, mapping and uh, science to policy, you know, it, around, I'm in the marine team, so marine biodiversity of the whole country, which is pretty vast. Awesome. Um, so that's a lot of different aspects, yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, um, Naomi's also gone into working with a conservation organization. And so all of us have gone on to um, have careers or hopeful careers in um, marine biodiversity conservation or biodiversity conservation. Um, and this role is a really good stepping stone um, for getting a broad understanding of issues on the ground, uh, working with fantastic teams. And um, yeah, I would highly recommend applying for this position if you get the opportunity. And because we're now pretty much out of time, um, has anyone got any, any last quick questions? Um, you guys on the panel, anything burning questions? Can I go? Yeah. How did, how did you all adjust to life after Aldabra, because that is my future very soon in January. So I'm just wondering how you adjusted the changes and you know what you took from the role. Ooh. Well, it was very difficult for the first six months adjusting to the um, world outside of Aldabra, I think. Um, but you do get used to it <laughs> eventually, but you, you always have that craving to go back and sit on the beach and look at the sharks and turtles swimming by. Um, yeah. I think it's really like Luke out for me. I so I literally went from this sort of touches on both questions. I see Nancy's put one in the chat. Um, my next role after the ASC role was with the IUCN in protected area management and working on world heritage. So and I went from I think it was 12 people pretty much most of the time that I was on Aldabra and I moved from there. Um, due to some unforeseen delays, straight to Bangkok. So I went from 12 people to about 12 million. And, you know, um, as much as the shop is well stocked, I went from, you know, limited supplies to supermarkets that were, you know, and choice. Like what I found difficult to adjust to, even more so than people always around you, was, you know, just that, um, overwhelming bombardment of, of light and colour and senses that were different and noises that were different to what you've, you've been used to. And I couldn't, I remember going to the supermarket and I, I walked out empty handed because I couldn't deal with the choices and I couldn't, you know, I was like, plan? <laughs> I don't need a plan. <laughs> you know, and I think you the only way you can adjust to that is to find the places those nature places to check back in and and refresh and understand and process what you've been doing and living for for two years and and what's ahead and i i think every, like every week i was gonna as a plug for the job every week there are things that i do that i think you know fundamentally i learned this or i learned some part of it on aldabra whether it's time management or fixing a computer because there's no other parts or, you know, all of those things. And I think 
it's focusing on those lessons and taking them into whatever's next and and the adjusting w- will happen it's tough but it will happen and you will constantly want to go back Nancy I could put my hand up tomorrow <laughs> and you know uh, yeah but but you learn to appreciate everything else as well can't believe you went from Aldabra to Bangkok that's a <laughs> crazy exchange insane <laughs> But yeah, time management, that's true. I'm sure I'll take that with me because you have to. Uh, I'll be quiet. To add on to that, Luke, the weird, the really hard part I found was that you go from being this like really tight knit team <clears throat> that even like when people were frustrated with each other, but you had people around you who you could be like, hey, like this or this or this. And then you go to being not with this team anymore. It's I found that to be like, and, and, you know, and having people who you would talk to about like, ah, Nancy, what about this? Or like, you know, but you, you go to a whole, it's, it's not just like the change in the complete environment around you. It's like the change and you have this team and you're like, ah, I'm here by myself again. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Maybe one more thing to add. For me, on Aldabra, I really became closer to myself. Like you, because there's not so much, you know, there's no TV and, 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 and civilization is just not there. So you're much more to yourself and you, you remember again what the things that you really like in life. And also being creative, making walks, taking photos, whatever. Um, you you become an, a different person on Aldabra, but actually you become more the person who you really are. You actually become a different person again in civilization who you are a bit less. So I, I think it's really important to try to hold on to the person who you are on Aldabra because that is the real you. Yeah, that's very true. And um. Obviously, it's been absolutely wonderful, actually, to reconnect as a group of ASCs on here, because in a way, although you do leave the team when you leave Aldabra, there's always the kind of SIF family that you're part of, and always ways as well to be in touch with people, whether it's through the newsletter or the SIF um, social media channels, which are updated with all the wonderful discoveries and stories like the discovery of the banded snail on West Grand Terre the other week. That was um, really cool to see. So yeah, it's always nice to keep in touch. And just um, to round things up, this is the first webinar in a series that will be put out over the next few months. And um, we have not confirmed when the next one is yet, but keep an eye out on the SIF Facebook page and Twitter and on Instagram. And there will also be some Instagram live events in September going forward. Um, so yeah, keep in touch with everyone. And yeah, thanks so much guys for joining this call. I think we could probably talk for hours. <laughs> it's a shame that we, we didn't book in more time, but yeah, it's been awesome to see you all. Thanks, April. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, April. Thank you. Thanks, April. Thank you so much. Thank this you, was everyone. fantastic. Maybe we'll do this again sometime um, with a beer or offline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Outtakes. All right. Well, um, thanks, everyone who tuned in. Have a great rest of the day. Luke, I think it's sunset time for you now. Indeed. I might have missed it, you know. I might have missed oh. it. I'm going to go check. <laughs> It's nah, either it's gone. No, it's, it's gone. gone. Oh well, you've got too late. Much tomorrow. Yeah, I have always tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, take care. Bye. It's still live. <laughs>